Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our drone speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Rafael Jaramillo. Rafael has a BS in engineering physics from Cornell and a PhD in experimental physics from the University of Chicago. And he's now bringing both his engineering and his physics backgrounds to bear on developing new concepts and solving problems towards new concepts in solar cells. And he's, he's doing that work uh, as a ZIP environmental fellow at Harvard, where he was the initiator of this work. And uh, thank you for coming to, to hear about what I think will be a very exciting piece of work. Thanks, Chad. Um, everyone can hear me. I can hear myself. So no, speak, louder. speak louder. Speak louder. OK, good. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, today, I want to tell you about a pretty uh, ongoing work on a pretty new project that is devoted to the material science issues that arise when you think about how to convert solar energy with extraordinarily high efficiency. Um, I'm currently a, a postdoc at Harvard, and um, specifically uh, my um, salary is paid by the Center for the Environment, which is a great interdisciplinary home to think about issues relating to the environment on, uh, with uh, many different approaches. So I want to cover a lot of ground today. I, I'm not going to feel bad if I don't get through all my detailed research results as long as I have taken a lot of time at the top and that everyone goes away uh, having learned one thing, hopefully two, about solar energy or semiconductor physics. Um, so uh, please feel free to interrupt and, and slow me down if necessary. I'm going to start with a, a brief outlook, basically my musing um, on the role of applied science, applied university-based science uh, in the field of energy and then highlight some particularly interesting problems facing advanced solar photovoltaics. Then I want to get into the details of an ongoing project that I am involved with looking at the electronic structure of transparent conducting oxides, the importance of which I'll take the time to explain. And then um, uh, finally, just for fun, I'm going to wrap up with a very brief, very high level overview of some of my PhD work. Um, not so much as an advertisement, but just to show you what types of projects someone like me who's been straddling the border between applied science, engineering, and physics, the types of things that I've been involved in. So um, I've been to a number of talks on energy in the last year or two, and uh, they all begin with some pictures that the speaker has pulled from the web to motivate their research. So, um, so that seems to, I wouldn't want to be the exception to the rule. Um, so uh, this is my overview of the energy crisis. And there's a lot of serious concerns, I'm sure you would agree with me, that could motivate a career's worth of work in the academic or the public sectors. Um, there are concerns over uh, security. So that's a warship escorting a tanker. This poor guy this, uh, exemplifies concerns over climate change and global warming. This is a very serious um, pollution concern that is highlighted by the disaster this summer in the Gulf. Um, there are economic issues associated with peak oil, which by the latest estimates we actually hit in 2006. This ex uh, is an illustration of some proliferation concerns that arise when considering one very promising renewable energy. Um, again, global warming, hydrofracking, that is hydraulic fracturing to extract natural gas reserves, is um, a technology that has a lot of promise and a lot of peril. This is a picture of a mountaintop. Well, the mountaintop used to be here. This is a picture of what's now what's left of a mountain in West Virginia. Um, this was supposed to be growing fuel pumps in Iowa, I suppose, with corn. Um, and these pictures are meant to illustrate uh, the limited market potential of present-day renewable energy technologies, which are, first and foremost, big uh, exposures of silicon, solar photovoltaics, and um, these offshore wind turbines, which we still can't see fit to build in the US. So that must be off of Denmark or the north coast of England. Um, so what can we do in the face of this energy crisis? Uh, many people, myself included to some extent, have been waiting for the government to send a clear signal that we are going to have a Manhattan Project for energy, um, or a Sputnik moment, if you like. That's the more current term. Um, so you know, I'm not that old, but this watercolor uh, is around to show me what Manhattan Project really looked like. Right? This, um, for those of you who aren't so well versed in the history of physics, this is a picture of uh, Chicago Pile 1, which is the first man-made self-sustaining nuclear reaction. It was a major milestone on the road to the um, development of the atomic bomb. 
And this, somewhere over here is Enrico Fermi, and this is all taking place in the squash court underneath the football stadium at the University of Chicago. Um, so this is, this is what the Manhattan Project looked like. Um, my claim is that no such dramatic thing is happening today or will happen in our lifetimes. At this time of crisis, our, our civilization faced an existential crisis and pursued in response a very specific goal, which is the building of an atom bomb. Okay. Today, we face no immediate existential crisis, at least no single existential immediate crisis. And the goal of powering an advanced economy entirely on clean renewable energy is one of the most diffuse, multifaceted goals you could possibly imagine. Um, it's also worth keeping in mind what university-based research is capable of. So um, this is a personal perspective. And I may get into a little bit of trouble uh, giving this viewpoint in engineering school. but. It motivates some of my own choices of research. Um, this Rube Goldberg machine is meant to illustrate what most people um, in the power producing sector see when they look at university-based clean energy research. Okay. Um, it is really complicated compared to business as usual. Business as usual being defined as going out to Wyoming and scooping out of the ground highly concentrated time integrated solar power in the form of coal and burning that. Okay, this is really complex. This is meant to illustrate everything that I'd like to do. Um, to the extent that solar photovoltaics are finding a place in the, in the market today, um, it is not due to benchtop research that anyone like me has been doing in the last 5, 10, or 15 years. Okay, we're talking about a long time horizon from the bench to making an impact in how much, for example, carbon we put into the atmosphere. And um, finally, I uh, just mean to dig it. Um, I guess my own relevance is that it's painfully obvious that uh, most policymakers also see what we do in the same light. So I don't want to dwell on that too long, but these are some of the realizations that help me frame my own research topics. So what is our role in the face of these challenges? Um, I think the role of applied science is to ride this fence of pursuing outstanding problems that are both technologically relevant and intellectually stimulating. And that's really the best you can do in the academy and in training students. And I should uh, specify here, my slide tells me to say technologically relevant explicitly to the long-term goal of running an advanced industrialized economy primarily on clean, renewable sources of energy. And that is my goal. Um, one significant long-term goal is a concept of hot electron photovoltaics. So I'm going to take a few slides to describe solar more generally and hot electron photovoltaics in particular, and hopefully give you an idea of why this is so promising. The idea that of a hot electron solar cell is based on this observation. Um, I'm not the first person to observe that the sun is a lot hotter than the Earth. The sun is about 6,000 Kelvin, and the Earth is about 300 Kelvin. And if you could operate a Carnot engine between these two heat baths, uh, you would be able to extract efficiency at close to 95%. Okay, so. Um, in practice, this is very difficult to do because the photogenerated electrons and holes in a semiconductor, which start out at time equals zero with this thermal signature, very quickly cool to something approaching this temperature. And in the process of doing so, knocks down your theoretical limiting efficiency significantly from 95% to something close to 33%. Um, so I'm going to this this figure here, which is taken from Jenny Nelson's book, *The Physics of Solar Cells*. This is a go-to book if you want to learn anything about the basics of semiconductor physics and solar energy conversion. Shows you the theoretical limiting efficiency for a hot electron solar cell, plotted here as a function of ba semiconductor band gap. Although for the purposes of this discussion, you could more or less ignore this abscissa and we'll focus on something like silicon. So I'll focus around one electron volt band gap, move up here, and you see for one sun. That means a planar structure looking up at the sky and seeing a really sliver, a sliver of 6,000 Kelvin, and um, most of 2 pi at the temperature of the atmosphere, which is you know, 300 Kelvin. The theoretical limiting efficiency for this technology is about 65%. If you um, put a lens in front of this thing so that this thing sees an entire sky's worth of 6,000 Kelvin radiation, your theoretical limiting efficiency then starts to approach the actual Carnot efficiency for converting thermal power from the sun to the earth, and that's close to 95%. Um, let's see here. To put these numbers in context, here is uh, a well-worn plot that's updated annually um, by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And this shows um, the best reported or best uh, certified 
conversion efficiencies as for a number of solar photovoltaic technologies as a function here of year. So this goes from 1975 to 2010. So I guess the point is this is 35 years worth of innovation. Um, so without, there's a lot of data in this plot, and you can pull it. I recommend that anyone who's interested look online for the NREL best cell efficiency plot, and you can look at this. It's very interesting. But um, <coughs> what I'm going to do for the purpose of this discussion is to scale that down so it fits on my plot. This is scale the y-axis, that is. Now I have here as a function of time, as a function of band gap. So I apologize for that mismatch of units. We're just looking at overall levels here. and. Um, then I'm going to highlight just a few important technologies, because you can't read that plot anyway. And now, just to make clear, these, um, these colored lines are just numbers. They're not anything plotted as a function of band gap. They're just to give you an idea of conversion efficiencies of various technologies. This black line here, as I said, gives you the theoretical limiting efficiency for hot electron solar energy conversion. This red line is the equivalent theoretical limiting efficiency for traditional single junction Photovoltaics. It's called the Shockley Quasar Limit after two people that worked out the thermodynamics of this a long time ago. And it's about 32 or 33 percent, depending on how you're doing the calculation. Um, it's interesting to note where present day best technologies fall under this theoretical upper bound. This is standing for crystalline silicon. This is the most well developed branch of photovoltaics, largely because the metallurgy of silicon processing has been extraordinarily thoroughly developed for since you know for 60, 70 years now for the purpose of advancing the electronics industry, so sort of standing on the shoulders of those giants. And the best research cell efficiency for single crystal silicon, which I believe is an industrial lab, I don't remember which company, is close to 30%, so 29%. So after decades, lifetimes of research, you're now seeing the actualized uh, single crystal photovoltaic devices approach the theoretical limiting efficiency. Under there are a few other technologies. SIG stands for copper indium gallium selenide, which turns out to be a really nice semiconductor for solar energy conversion. Um, these are marketable products, and the best research cell efficiency based on this uh, architecture is 19%, I think. Um, below that is cadmium telluride, which is um, another alternative semiconductor that has found a place in the marketplace. Actually, the largest manufacturer of solar cells in the world uses cadmium telluride technology. It's first solar in Ohio. Um, and then below that is representative of a number of uh, approaches using organic semiconductors. And they hover in the 8, 9. I don't think any organic has busted through the 10% psychological limit yet. Yeah? Is this shock limit dependent on band gap? Uh, no, that's optimized for band gap. So it's optimized for, optimized for band gap, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, cadmium telluride actually has a more optimal band gap than silicon. It also has a direct transition. The, 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 the state of materials development for cadmium telluride is just far, far behind silicon. That's true for anything. Silicon is the most well understood material you possibly could start to plan to hope to work with. That's a very good point, though, that I didn't intend to highlight. But some of the, in the abstract, um, advantages that these materials have over silicon um, aren't realized in practice simply because of the tremendous technological um, head start that silicon, anything, any technology based on silicon has. And this motivates a lot of work on silicon. <laughs> um, so this is a good time to stop and give you a bit of culture in the field. That is, what do these generations mean? Even if you read the New York Times, you'll see people talk about the generations of solar cells. So I just wanted to explain what that means. First generation means bulk single crystal absorbers. So these are the big heavy silicon crystal ingots that have been sitting on rooftops for decades. And, and you know, even we're on the roof of the White House in the 70s, I'm told. Um, second, and that's represented by this blue line here. Second generation are thin films. So the reason why you would go from a really well understood material like single crystal silicon to a thin film is to save material costs. That's it. Um, Thin film technologies with higher absorption coefficients allow you to use much less of a precious resource, the precious resource being high quality uh, semiconductor grade silicon. So that includes this copper indium gallium selenide or these cadmium telluride. Whereas these are grown in Boole form using single crystal growth techniques, these semiconductors are sometimes even put down from solution. So anyone who's interested in scale up and the cost of implementing a technology, you know, that's very attractive. Um, that's thin film. And then Third generation is really undefined. Um, OK, so I'll define it. <laughs> Conversion efficiency ex exceeding that of single crystal silicon in low cost design and preferably with non-toxic abundant constituents. 
So that's a wish list, is really what third generation means. Although some people might argue that third generation is actually implemented with certain nanostructured architectures, and fourth generation is the wish list. But really, if, if this is a good definition that this first, second generation, we know what those mean. Third generation is everything else that we hope to achieve. Um, so now I've just told you what a great idea hot electron photovoltaics is. Well, that's been known for decades, since the early 80s at least, that you know this is something we should really like to do. Um, it goes without saying that, that the scientific obstacles must be really difficult or else someone would have done it already. Uh, so I'm going to use this cartoon to illustrate the scientific obstacles standing in the way of hot electron photovoltaics. Um, this type of cartoon I've drawn myself in the past, but they also float around on the web. And so I took, I took this from the National Institute of Material Science of Japan. And I'm about, to, I'm, not, I'm about to pick on them, but I don't mean to pick on them, because a lot of people are making these sorts of cartoons. So let me tell you why this is preposterous. Um, I'll tell you what this is meant to illustrate. This is a sunbeam. And uh, these are quantum dots. So these are semiconductor nanocrystals that are about 2 to 10 nanometers wide, depending on the material and the intended application. And they're floating in a nice ordered array. And they're supported by this blue hazy stuff. And um, what's meant to happen is that the sun comes in and generates in one of these quantum dots an electron hole pair. That's the origin of the uh, of photoelectric conversion. And that electron, the electron is pulled, in this case, in this direction, down to this metallic electrode. And the hole is pulled in this direction, up to this transparent electrode. This is done quickly and efficiently by this blue hazy stuff. And then the, these the silver bus bars up here pull the, uh, in this case, the holes off and, well, actually push the holes off into an external circuit to do work. So um, never mind the fact that, that these are typically screen printed. So you're talking about several millimeters wide, and these are several nanometers wide. The real hurdle uh, here is the blue hazy stuff that somehow converts what is essentially a confined nanometer scale process of electron hole generation converts that to a very meso or macroscopic process that is you know, current in a circuit that we could use. Um, so this cartoon actually highlights some really interesting research directions that encompass a lot of what a lot of people in material science and applied physics departments are doing these days. Um, I'm going to get to the specifics of why this cartoon is necessary for hot electron photovoltaics in one slide, but let me just take the time to define some open-ended research projects that this sort of picture illustrates. One is that of uh, electrical connections on the nanoscale. So I've mentioned that these are highly, this, everything that happens in these quantum dots is a highly confined process. And everything that happens out here is a highly deconfined process. Um, if you're going to achieve efficient charge transfer from this to this, you need to think about, for example, connecting confined versus extended wave functions as quantum mechanical tunneling is your is your uh, mechanism of choice. You also have necessarily many different materials involved in the fabrication of a device like this. So an electron, as it makes its way through the device, is going to encounter grain boundaries and interfaces. And each of those grain boundaries or interfaces can either impede or uh, help uh, the conversion process. So you, this, it, this is a lot more inherently complicated than using single crystal of silicon to create electricity from sunlight. Um, now getting to the problem of hot electron photovoltaics, I want to highlight these, these um, time-dependent processes in the next slide. But now I'll just mention that there's this problem of non-equilibrium charge transport. Um, I pointed out a few slides ago that the sun is hotter than the Earth. I'm such a genius. Um, so why can't we use that energy? The reason is that as soon as the electrons and holes are generated by sunlight, they very quickly cool to the temperature of the lattice. It's that cooling process that gives you the big hit in theoretical limiting efficiency from 95 to 32%. And approaches to slowing down that cooling have been thought about and only in very recent years begun to be implemented in the laboratory. Um, so there are some very fundamental uh, questions related to how to achieve non-equilibrium transport of charge in a real device structure. And then finally, you don't want to do this with materials that are, someone in the future might actually be able to afford. You know, I, I've been growing thin films using magnetron sputtering techniques. Which means that the materials you put down don't behave anything like they do in theory. Um, I've been looking at granular thin films. And then uh, people, uh, not myself, but other people bring up issues of abundance, that is, earth abundance, and cost, and scalability. All of these are concerns. 
although perhaps not most immediate concerns for such a long-term project as this one. Um, these are only a handful of the outstanding science problems that are highlighted by this cartoon. Um, I just want to point out a few more. These are the ones that I feel that I've been starting to address in the last year. But there are, there are whole uh, research labs and practically whole departments dedicated to the growth and characterization of these semiconductor nanocrystals that falls under epitaxial, epitaxial self-assembly or, semi, or um, colloidal chemistry. There is this issue of self-assembly of these um, quantum dots once you have them. You know, here they're in a nice ordered array. How did they get that way? Is it important that they're in this distribution? Um, all of those things matter for the functionality of the device, but the way to actually get this to occur is uh, not trivial. There's the problem of light matter coupling. This is a very serious one. Um, this is a beam of sunlight that here is getting absorbed by a total of 10 nanometers of semi semiconductors, something like this. That's absurd. Um, there are pathways to increase the effective optical depth of a device like this. Essentially, we don't want to be able to see through this. It's supposed to look black to us because it's supposed to absorb all of sunlight. Um, there, there are a lot of research labs that are looking at plasmonic enhanced light matter coupling as a way of getting around the fact that four quantum dots would never absorb all of the light that all of the energy of the sun have to give, and so on. So um, this really is meant to highlight two things. One is uh, it's meant to motivate some of the particular problems that I've been working on, but it's also meant to give you the notion that these sorts of cartoons um, serve a real purpose because they motivate a lot of really interesting and important problems in applied science and material science today. So I'm going to take one more slide to focus a little bit on that issue of um, time-dependent processes in hot electron photovoltaics and tell you why it is that electrons cool so quickly from the temperature of the sun to the temperature of the Earth. Um, this illustration is taken again from Jenny Nelson's book on the physics of solar cells. It shows the multiple time scales involved in hot electron energy conversion. Um, so uh, the y-axis here is electron energy in a sort of band structure type diagram. And then these are four snapshots in time, um, really four different orders of magnitude in time. At t equals 0, light is absorbed and creates an electron hole population. Um, this is the conduction band edge. This is the valence band edge, meaning no electrons can live in this energy regime. However, electrons can live up in this energy regime, and holes can live down here. And these lines, I think, are meant to illustrate the uh, the, the solar spectrum, which kind of looks like a black body spectrum minus absorption bands that are due to um, water absorption in the atmosphere. So the effective temperature is not actually the temperature of the sun because there's some energy that goes into heating the atmosphere. Um, so these carriers, these electrons and these holes equilibrate amongst themselves to form a true thermal distribution on a time scale that's about femtoseconds. So that's 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Um, give or take an order of magnitude, but femtosecond time scale. And so that's portrayed here by an, a population of electrons with, temp, with uh, mean kinetic energy by the equal partition theorem, 3 halves kth. That's T sub hot, I suppose. And that's a number that's close to 6,000 Kelvin. And similarly, you have a population of holes with presumably the same 3 halves kth mean kinetic energy. Then what happens is that these charges collide with the ions in the lattice, generate phonons, in other words, heat, and cool themselves down. This is the cooling process. This happens on a time scale, depending on the material, that ranges from picoseconds to nanoseconds. And in that time scale, you have, a, you have the cooling from close to the temperature of the sun to something close to the temperature of the Earth. And finally, the population density of these electrons in these holes is reduced. That's meant these, these bumps got shorter um, by a process of radiative recombination. So when you want to calculate the theoretical limiting efficiency that corresponds to present day technologies, that's what I call the Shockley Quasar limit, you're starting from this picture here, where you have um, an electron and hole gas that are in thermal equilibrium with their host lattice and uh, in radiative equilibrium with the atmosphere. To get to the 60 Six, 67% theoretical limiting efficiency, 95% in full concentration, you start from this population. So how do you actually get this population to do work in an external circuit? There are really three barriers. The first is to slow down this process of cooling. And this is actually the area in which the most work has been done, um, principally by colloidal chemists who can have amazing control over the stoichiometry and size of these semiconductor nanocrystals. Um, the reason why this 
picoseconds now has an ellipsis connecting it to nanoseconds is because of work done over the past 15 to 20 years on slowing down this process of cooling in semiconductor nanocrystals to the point where you have systems in which the cooling is many nanoseconds, which is an eternity compared to what nature gives us on its own. The second problem is that a fast, efficient extraction. So if, you're, if you want to s slow down one process, presumably it's because you want to speed up another process so that they can occur on roughly the same time scale. Um, this is the problem that I've been thinking most about and is the problem that motivates the material science work that I'm going to present later on this, in this hour. Um, uh, I propose in particular to use Brenner's and quantum mechanical tun tunneling as a way of uh, extracting charges quickly and efficiently. Although I don't want to dwell so much on this process, so much as tell you that there are known pathways not yet implemented for good material science reasons to try to get this done. And the third goal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip entirely. The third is um, that of narrowband electrodes. I'm not going to skip it entirely. Which means essentially that if you don't lose your, your useful energy to thermalization in the semiconductor nanocrystals, you ought also not to lose it to thermalization in the external leads. So you need to implement this with the right suite of materials. Hmm? Oh, okay. Moving on. In particular, the question that I've asked myself as a way of getting to this problem of fast, efficient extraction is can the electrode absorber interface be harnessed to enhance efficiency? So one thing that you should notice about that cartoon a few slides ago is that there are different colors involved. All advanced optoelectronic devices are necessarily hybrid, meaning they have different types of materials responsible for different functionalities in the device. And the interfaces between those different types of materials um, can be uh, detrimental or can be beneficial. Um, one way that I propose that that interface can be beneficial is to use an interface between a, uh, a transparent conductor and a semiconductor to create a Schottky barrier, which I will describe in detail in a few slides for those of you who don't have the Semiconductor Physics 101. And to use that Schottky barrier to create a resonant tunneling between buried semiconductor quantum dots and an external electrode. Um, I don't know if this sounds outlandish to you, but it's in fact not outlandish. This sort of charge transfer process has been studied in a different context with different suites of materials over the years um, in an effort to study the mean, inelastic mean free path of hot electrons in various um, base electrodes. Um, what I propose to do is to implement this type of structure using, uh, instead of a base electrode, a transparent conducting electrode, which is inherently more tunable than a typical base electrode like gold or aluminum. Okay, I'm sorry if this if this slide was a little bit technical. I'm going to take a step back here and explain to you um, some of the details of what, some of the fundamentals of uh, what I'm looking at, and I want everyone to at least understand what the work function is. So. Let me describe to you how you actually implement this. In order to implement this, you need to be able to tune the work function of a material. The work function, which is a semiconductor concept, is the minimum energy required to completely remove an electron from a solid. So if you imagine reaching into a semiconductor and pulling out an electron and moving it to infinity, what is the energy gained or lost in that process? Um, the typical way that this is approached in uh, undergraduate electromagnetics or uh, electrostatics is Rather, you have a charge in infinity, you bring it in to zero radius, and you ask how much energy has it gained. This is sort of the equivalent for a real material. Um, and allow me to illustrate what, with this importance by stepping you through the process of formation of a Schottky barrier, which is another foundational concept in semiconductor physics. Um, this portrays two different materials that are not yet in physical contact. On the left is a metal. Out here is this line is the vacuum energy. This is the energy of that electron that has been taken to infinity. It's floating in free space. It's not interacting with anything or anybody. If it were to be brought into this first material, which is kind of light blue because I want this to be a transparent conducting oxide, but it can be anything, it would gain energy phi 1. This is the work function of this first material. If it instead were to be brought onto the semiconductor on the right here, it would gain energy phi 2, which I've drawn as a smaller number than phi 1, because this is typically the case. The chemical potential of, the elect of an electron in a real material has another name. It's called the Fermi energy. So the Fermi energy of this metallic electrode is down here, and the Fermi energy of this semiconductor is up here. Just like when you connect two buckets with a hose, you have a transfer of water from the higher potential energy 
bucket to the lower potential energy bucket if the buckets are if the water levels are not initially equal. When you bring two materials into contact, you have a flow of electrons downhill in energy space. So if you were to now connect these two materials with a wire, or actually grow one of them on top of another, which is more, um, more uh, directly the case, you have the flow of electrons downhill in energy space from the semiconductor to the metal. Um, without getting into the details of band bending, this has the effect of adding net negative charge to the metal and net positive charge, because you have overall charge balance. There's no charge created or constructed um, in the semiconductor. And as a result, you have a dipole. You have positive charges and negative charges. And this uh, is implemented in the semiconductor by what's called a band bending. This is a barrier to electron transfer. So after a point, you have what essentially a slope in, in energy that prevents the transfer of electrons from this material to this material. They need to have enough energy to get up and over that slope and back, back down. This is the basis of a lot of rectification. For example, uh, some diodes, uh, some, um, some uh, varistor materials, and a lot of sort of really useful uh, electronic functionalities are based on the formation of just this sort of electrostatic barrier to electron transfer from a semiconductor to a metal. And it's all based on the difference in work function between two materials. So if you can tune the work function of one or another material, you can tune the height of this barrier. And if you can tune the height of this barrier controllably, you can implement a lot of interesting functions. Um, OK, so hopefully I've motivated to some extent why one might want to tune this energy. Um, however, the work function is a notorious thing to measure, never mind to alter. It's determined by two things, the bulk band structure of a material. This is pretty easy to understand from you know, with uh, undergraduate uh, semiconductor physics. Oh, okay. Um, but it's notoriously difficult to control. However, there's also the surface termination. There's actually the state of the surface. Did you breathe on your material in the last hour? That can actually affect the work function. This is harder to understand because it gets into a lot of really tricky surface chemistry. However, it's notoriously easy to control. As I just suggested, you can breathe on a material and change the work function by an entire volt. And this is meant to illustrate here. This, this is a hydroxide group because this material was exposed to air. And so you have all sorts of uh, redox chemistry happening on the surface. This hydroxide group has a mirror charge in the, in, in the sample. And so you have an electron that gets transferred to OH and, and positively charged holes here. And if you think about just elementary electrostatics, the presence of this dipole or all sorts of things like this, which it can exist on a real surface, changes the energy necessary to remove an electron to infinity. It changes the actual work function of this material. So if you were to go to Wikipedia and look up the work function of, look up work function, you get a table. It has elements and numbers listed. Those numbers are just a vague representation of what you might actually get if you were to try to grow a real device. OK, so I've introduced you to the concept of hot electron photovoltaics. I've skimmed over the importance of implementing a Schottky barrier uh, in order to extract hot electron current. But I've taken the time to explain to you why controlling the work function is important for controlling the properties of a Schottky barrier. So those are some of the things I want you to learn. Now I'm going to explain um, the actual material that I've been working with, because I haven't actually gotten to any material science yet. Um, I've been looking at transparent conducting oxides, which explains why my metals have been portrayed in light blue this whole time. Um, transparent conducting oxides, or TCOs, are a very widely used industrial material, which are present in all sorts of technologies, which many of you probably have on your desk right now or in your pockets. I'll get to that. This is a field of cadmium telluride thin film solar cells. Um, I think in Germany, although I don't actually know, but I know manufactured by First Solar is that Ohio company, because I took this picture from their website. Um, TCOs are used as the front contact material in all thin film solar photovoltaic technologies. Uh, they're also used in pretty much all third generation solar photovoltaics for, again, this reason that all advanced solar concepts inherently involve multiple different types of materials. And you need a front electrode that light can get through, hence transparent conducting. Um, Come on. TCOs are actually um, used. Uh, this whole building is coated in TCOs. And probably this building that we're standing in is new enough, so are its windows. Uh, because of their electronic properties, they reflect very efficiently in the infrared while they transmit in the visible. So they're useful for thermal control. That is, they keep buildings hot in the winter and cool in the summer and save on uh, HVAC costs that way. And um, so all, all architectural glass is TCO coated. and. Uh, I've never visited a float glass line. I've been told it's an incredible operation to see. And anyone should take the opportunity to see a float glass line once in their life. Um, 
most float glass lines who make architectural glass now have a chemical va vapor deposition chamber integrated into the float glass line explicitly for the purpose of laying down uh, indium tin oxide based coatings on glass. So this uh, is an operation on an unimaginable scale. I'd really like to go see that one day. Um, TCOs are used anywhere you need uh, transparent electronics. So there's a, I don't actually know whether it's indium or zinc based, but there's TCO patterned on the front of your eye things because you need to be able to see through something that has spatial sensitivity for functionality. And um, this is, an, so in football it's necessary because in order, to fi in order to implement flat panel displays, you need pattern TCO electrodes on the front. Um, so these materials that I've become involved with are pretty widely applicable uh, to a lot of present day um, and as uh, a lot of present day technologies, which is kind of neat because you like to work on something that has current and future applicability. Um, now sort of, okay, so back to the gritty stuff. What TCOs actually are in semiconductor language, they're degenerate wide band gap oxides. So the band gap is this region in which electrons cannot live, and it defines the transparency of a material. If a band gap is larger than the energy that corresponds to the shortest wavelength of light that our eyes can see, then that wavelength of light and all wavelengths longer than it can get through the material. It's transparent as far as we know, as far as our eyes can see. Um, and so this is represented by this equation here, where h nu, this is the uh, frequency of the light, is smaller than the band gap, E sub g. And for zinc oxide, which is the material which I've been working with, this band gap is uh, in the undoped state between 3.3 .3 and 3.4 electron volts. Amazingly, there's still some debate over that. But that's going to make this material transparent for our eyes. Um, so you can see through windows, and you can see football. Um, However, it conducts electricity because these are degenerately doped materials. And what that means, uh, I'm going to illustrate that. This is called the spaghetti diagram. It's meant to be confusing. But it gives you, in energy space, the a distribution of how the, energetics, the energies that electrons can take. And I'm going to just zoom in here. Um, never mind about the x-axis. I really do apologize for this. But I meant to illustrate how you degenerately dope a material. This is uh, increasing energy in the vertical direction. This is the valence band edge, and this is the conduction band edge. In between these two energies is the band gap. This is responsible for the transparency. In a transparent conducting oxide, you dope the material to the point where you fill up this conduction band with electrons to some extent. Those electrons are then free to conduct electricity. So that makes this actually a pretty good metal. Um, in particular, for indium tin oxide, you dope with, uh, for indium tin oxide, you take indium oxide, you dope with tin oxide at um, about 15 to 20 mole percent ratio. For aluminum doped zinc oxide, you take zinc oxide and you dope with aluminum, about 1 to 3 atomic percent ratio. And this gives you a carrier density on the order of 10 to the 19 to 10 to the 21 inverse centimeters, which makes these metals. And uh, resistivities at room temperature on the order of 10 to the minus 4 ohm centimeters. So to put that in context, that's only a factor of 50 or 100 uh, more resistive than a real metal like aluminum. So th these are pretty good conductors, and that's why they're useful for present day technology. Um, in the lab, I grow uh, aluminum dope zinc oxide by reactive RF sputtering. So that's a physical vapor deposition technique. Um, the film properties are most strongly controlled by varying the oxygen content. And this is just a gratuitous picture I took outside of our building, showing you what happens when you go from low oxygen content to high oxygen content. This film you can't see through very well, but it conducts electricity very well. This is closer to just a messy metal. This material up here you can see through, but it doesn't collect electricity at all. In between is an optimal material for technological applications. And uh, this optimality is measured by a figure of merit. Everything needs a figure of merit. Um, this figure of merit combines the resistance and the optical absorption in just such a way to cancel out the thickness dependence. So you can grow your films. You can measure the resistance. You can measure the absorption and then put your film that you just grew on a plot and see whether it's good or bad. So now I want to connect my two little mini themes together. I've described to you work function. I've described to you transparent conducting oxides. Um, and I want to describe the role that work function has in controlling the efficiency of solar cells, which use transparent conducting oxides. All hybrid solar cells have multiple materials, as I've made this point repeatedly. Um, in particular, you have some material, this is drawn as an organic, which is responsible for light absorption and electron hole creation. And then you have 
um, on f facing each other across this absorber layer, a, um, a hole transport layer and an, an electron transport layer. These are meant to draw the pull the electron in one direction and the hole in the other direction so that they can be pushed off to external circuitry to do work. Um, the fact that the hole goes in one direction and the electron goes in another direction is largely determined by the fact that these two materials are meant to have very different work functions. And the efficiency of this device is to a large extent controlled by the difference. It's controlled by many things. So one of the important factors is the difference in work function between these two materials. So if I were in interested in improving the efficiency of present day solar photovoltaic thin film technology, I would want to get this work function as high as possible, which is in itself a worthy research goal. Um, so this is where I started, actually, about a year, a little over a year ago. Uh, and um, I said, OK, I want to implement this ballistic electron structure. And I know that the work function of the uh, transparent electrode is very important. And so I want to go to the literature and see how to get a high work function electrode. Um, however, because the work function, as I've come to understand, because the work function is, highly, is, is a highly surface sensitive property, reports in the literature for the work function of zinc oxide-based transparent conducting oxides vary all over the map. So this is, I, I apologize, I took a little poetic license here, but I, I went to um, all the literature and I looked at for the work function of zinc oxide-based TCOs. And according to band structure, there should be very little variation in this number across different reports. However, here, this is different papers. I don't know what kind of an x-axis that is, but it's different papers. And, and for each paper, I gave you an idea of the distribution. This looks like Charlie Brown's sweater. So this gives you an idea of the range of work function that is reported for this narrowly defined class of materials. And it, it varies from the peaks at over 5.5, which is absurd, absurdly high, to 3.5, which is absurdly low. This is 2 electron volts. And for anyone who's actually trying to build a device, this is like you might as well not even pretend to know what the work function is. So my project um, became one of trying to measure and then understand how the work function in these materials is varied as you change the growth conditions. Now, um, I have gone a little bit slow, but uh, I told you I was going to, so I'm not going to feel bad about it. Um, the work function trends in zinc aluminum oxide. And I want to go back to this idea that the work function is controlled by two things. One is the bulk band structure, and the other is the surface termination. In other words, did you breathe on it today? So to first order, the work function, uh, as, you, as you change through bulk band structure techniques, this offset of the Fermi energy minus the valence energy, remember, the work function is the vacuum energy minus the Fermi energy. So this is a highly simplified energy band here. As you change this Fermi level, phi should change. So this is a, a report from the literature where they sputter a bunch of films and they change where this Fermi level is. And what they see is, yeah, it's, it's monotonic, right? But there's a tremendous amount of scatter. And the fact is, this is varying over almost our 5 to 3.5 electron volts, um, which is completely unsupported for reasons that I'll just state this um, uh, unsupported claim, that this is completely unsupported by a bulk band structure theory of this material. Something, something else is going on. Um, I, I started by taking a much more narrow view of this, which is, what happens right around optimum? Because this is what we care about. When I was talking about changing the oxygen content, you go from conducting but not transparent to transparent but not conducting. Right in the middle is a sweet spot, growth conditions. Um, this is the figure of merit as a function of oxygen content. And you see it's very sharply spiked. So if you're growing a material or if you're running an industrial process, you want to be right here. You really do, you know, you don't want to, you want to have that oxygen content tuned very precisely. However, right there at optimum oxygen content, it turns out that the work function has some pretty funny non-monotonic behavior. It varies sharply and steeply over several hundred millielectron volts. And so while this is good for transparency and, condu and conductivity, this is not good for predicting the efficiency of your resulting device. This is actually, this sort of thing has been seen before, as it turns out. But uh, I saw this and said, well, this makes sense because a lot of people grow materials and grow devices. and uh, and the resulting efficiencies can't really be predicted by what we think we understand about the transparent conducting oxide work function. So um, mm, OK, I'm going to take the time to explain my measurement technique, because uh, I think it's interesting. Um, I just reported for you a uh, work function measurements as a function of oxygen content. Oxygen content is controlled by simply how much oxygen you flow into the growth chamber. It's relatively easy to understand. Um, work function is a very difficult thing to measure. So I want to tell you how we measure it, because I think it's kind of cool. It's called Kelvin force probe. And it has nothing to do with temperature. But it was developed by Lord Kelvin initially. So everyone should know Kelvin force probe has nothing to do with temperature. Um, this is a similar picture to the one I draw you before to illustrate how the formation of an n-type Schottky barrier rises. 
Here I have a probe, he's a pointy guy, and a sample. They have different work functions, and right now they're separated by vacuum. They're unconnected electrically. Okay, so now what I've done is run a wire between the two of them. And um, as I described before, electrons flow downhill in potential energy space. So you have a net flow of electrons from the low work function material to the high work function material. And we have drawn that here is a transfer of electrons from the sample to the probe. The techniques works the other way around, but just for concreteness, I wanted to illustrate in one direction. Now I have a negatively charged probe electrode and a positively charged sample electrode, and there's a force between them because they're electric field lines extending from this surface to this surface. Now, if you have a way of measuring that force, if you have a transduction mechanism, you can then do something to measure the difference in work function. You can apply a bias. And if you apply a bias that's exactly equal and opposite to the work function difference between these two materials, you cancel out the you you um, cancel the buildup of force uh, buildup of charge. I'm sorry. You know out the force, and then you know that the dif what the difference in work function is because it's exactly the bias that you applied. So this is a null measurement. You measure a force, you apply a bias, and you tune the bias until you've nulled out the force. All right. Um, in practice, the way you implement this is with uh, an atomic force microscope with a conducting tip. So you uh, you you scan your conducting tip over your sample surface. Um, and you feed the, you have a force transducer, and you feed that into the, the uh, front end of a closed loop, and you ask the closed loop to null out the force by adjusting the bias. So this is the way, you know, linear control. And um, what you get uh, for a real sample is a picture that looks like this. This is a picture of uh, a sample on which I've laid down gold interdigitated electrodes. Gold has a relatively well characterized work function. As a noble metal, um, has a work function as stable as any other material you can get your hands on. And um, the way that this measurement works, actually, uh, a, a small measured value means a high sample work function and vice versa. So here I've scanned over a, a sample with lithographically defined gold fingers. And by measuring the difference between this level and this level, and this is now in, in, in a voltage space. So this color map is a function of voltage. By measuring the difference between this level and this level, I can measure the difference in work function between my material and gold. And in practice, you would just make a histogram of values and fit two peaks and look at the difference, you know, the, the separation between those two peaks and thereby get the difference in work function. So that's how we measure work function. And that was actually kind of neat. Um, however, uh, you can do more. I mentioned that this is done with an atomic force microscope, which means that I don't just measure the work function of the material on a macroscopic basis. I actually have a high degree of resolution over the nanostructure of the work function. In particular, um, this is a sputtered material. It doesn't go down as one smooth, perfect single crystal. It's highly granular. So it's a bumpy material. You have uh, crystallite grains, and they have grain boundaries. Those are non-crystalline interfaces. And what I found is actually really cool. Um, uh, focus just on the right-hand side here. Now, these are three samples with low oxygen content, optimal, and then high oxygen content. And this color map shows you this work function measured across the film. And what we see is that actually the optimal film has a high degree of work function contrast between the green and green boundaries. Um, going further, if you remember, dark equals large work function, light equals small work function. It's kind of inverted that way. And this is consistent with what we would expect, because the green boundaries are high work function elements. The green boundaries are places which are preferentially oxidized by the ambient environment. Preferential oxidation means the, the uh, the electrochemical potential for electrons is lowered in those regions. Therefore, those regions have higher work function. Those regions also present a barrier to transport. What we're seeing here is this work function granularity is a representation of what limits the electrical conductivity of these materials, and what has been known for some time to limit the electrical conductivity of these materials. That is, electrons have a hard time hopping between grains. This, is actually, this actually gets at how you might start to optimize uh, these materials for electrical conductivity. Now, um, I'm going to skip uh, this defect. This is a defect chemistry reactions. These are pictures. These are um, band structure cartoons. I'm going to skip these. Um, just to, I'm going to skip uh, some x-ray photoelectron spectroscopy results. I have about five minutes. Is that right? OK. Just to get to, um, uh, I spent a lot of time up front. So this is an, now an unsupported model, because I skipped the, uh, some complementary spectroscopy. But I want to get to this model, because it gives you an idea of what's going on in this granular material. This is a highly um, abstracted cartoon. These are grain boundaries. So if you think of a bunch of crystallites growing together and then hitting each other, and then 
they, they reach an impasse, and that impasse is called the grain boundary. For low oxygen content, these, there's, the grains themselves are very efficient oxygen-getting materials. That is, they absorb oxygen into their lattice very effectively because they want to reach stoichiometry. As a result, you have very small amount of segregated oxygen defects along the grain boundaries, which in turn means that you have very little contrast as you scan over the top of this material and probe the work function over the grain boundaries as opposed to over the grains. As you go towards optimal material, you have an increase in the density of oxygen uh, defects segregated along the grain boundaries. And for well understood reasons, now, well, it's all obvious in hindsight, these grain boundaries should appear as high work function elements. So now you're starting to develop a gra electronic granularity as you scan across this material. And you're sensitive to the oxidation state on grain boundaries as opposed to over grains. And finally, if you, really, if you really aggressively oxidize this material, which we can explicitly show by post-processing annealing and UV ozone environment, you get to the point where the, there are oxygen defects uniformly populated across the front face of the surface. And you reach a situation where, again, you have very little contrast in the work function as you scan across the sample with a scanning probe tip. Right at optimal, you have a situation where you have high oxygen defects segregated along the grain boundaries. And the grains themselves, they're optimized, which actually tends to push their Fermi level up, push their work function down. So right here, you, go, you expect now the highest degree of contrast in work function on and off grain boundaries. So this is a model that actually not only explains uh, the granularity, the, these pretty image pictures we saw of the work function on and off grain boundaries, it also explains the overall trend in work function. Um, so we think this is a neat little story because it gives, uh, gives us sort of some design guidelines going forward to create um, a, a oxide electrode conductors with a tunable work function, which is really important for implementing the hot electron transfer mechanism that uh, I intend to study. So um, hopefully that wasn't too much of a whirlwind. I'm going to just summarize what I've told you about zinc aluminum oxide electronic structure. We identified, or at least pointed out to you, the trend in work function versus oxygen stoichiometry. Um, I presented a working model supported by Kelvin force microscopy, and I skipped over the photoelectron spectroscopy in the interest of time. Um, and uh, I'm not even going to talk about what I didn't show. And now for something completely different, just because it's fun. I did my PhD in uh, the area of quantum magnetism, quantum phase transitions. And um, in practice, that meant studying what happens to elemental chromium at 100,000 atmospheres and temperatures ranging from 50 millikelvin to 3 kelvin, so low temperature, high pressure physics, which is really fun stuff. You use a diamond anvil cell to generate such high pressures. Um, so these are two opposed diamonds with a metallic gasket. This is actually a picture of a single crystal sample wired up with gold leads for electrical transport. And you're looking through, the, through one of the top diamonds on the microscope. And uh, this, this here is the, is the gasket that contains the pressure in the radial direction. And all you do is you squeeze these diamonds together. It's, a simple, it's um, conceptually as simple as it sounds. It's very tricky in practice. You get a lot of popped, high quality uh, natural gemstones. And um, where you do this in a, in a, you need a good machine shop to do this kind of work. You have a little pressure cell, but it's, it's kind of benchtop science because everything fits like right here. Um, so this is a picture looking down the barrel of the diamonds of a high pressure diamond anvil cell mounted on the cold finger of a cryostat. Because as I say, we need to get to low temperatures. This whole thing goes onto a diffractometer at an X-ray beam line at the advanced photon source. So we can do scattering probes of the antiferromagnetic recorder parameter. Or if we want to do magnetotransport studies, it goes into this cryostat. In a setup, this, and this is really Rube Goldberg, the setup that I built with the cryostat on rails so it can slide over onto this optical bench to do some fluorescent spectroscopy or over here into this electromagnet to do hall measurements. So that's just fun stuff, and I wanted to let you know that kind of work was being done. Um, I'm going to just, these are some ongoing projects uh, in my old field of quantum condensed matter. And um, so I want to wrap up. I gave you uh, some nice pictures that in some sense, encapsulate my outlook for energy and the role of applied science in meeting the energy crisis. I highlighted some significant open problems for advanced electron photovoltaics. Gave you a taste of some results of ours on electronic structure of granular zinc aluminum oxide. Um, skipped over ongoing work with prototype devices and told you about the kinds of things that you can do at high pressure and low temperature on an X-ray beam line. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people, in particular some collaborators at Harvard. This is a, a final year PhD student who I've been advising and a terrific RU student from last summer, a rising, so a rising sophomore from Stanford, who's incredibly competent and mature, uh, way more so than I was as a rising sophomore. Um, I work in, uh, in concert with two uh, PIs 
at, uh, at Harvard, at Sriram Ramanathan and Venki Narayana Murthy, both at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And some of that high pressure, low temperature stuff was done in collaboration with uh, Yijin Feng at the Argonne National Laboratory. And my PhD advisor, Tom Rosenbaum at the University of Chicago. And this work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the DOE, and the Harvard Center for the Environment. Thanks a lot. That in itself is a fundamental question. Yeah. I don't have a better idea than you do. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't intend to get sidetracked by what is the time scale for tunneling. You have some sort of attempt frequency that you can model, but we don't really understand what is the time scale for 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 resonant tunneling. Yeah, I mean, it, that gets in some fundamental quantum mechanics, actually. <laughs> Uh, I hope so. Oxides are complicated. But what's nice about oxides is they're way more tunable than metals. I mean, so I'm dealing with an oxide that is a metal because it conducts electricity at zero temperature. But it, it, it's much more tunable than, than a typical metallic base layer that you might lay down. For example, the, the fact that you can measure a work function that varies over two electron volts is kind of a problem that's also an opportunity. Might you want to use Sure. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not partisan to that. And another advantage to oxides um, is that uh, for reasons to do with the p-type bonding in oxygen, you have, which is probably true of nitrogen too, they're inherently narrow band. And narrow band is sort of the third major challenge for hot electron photovoltaics that I totally skipped over. But it's another advantage of working with oxide electrodes. It allows you a better chance in finding a material combination in which you can have adiabatic transfer of energy from the nanoscale absorbers to the external electrodes. So I like oxides, but yeah, sure. Let's talk about nitrides sometime. <laughs> nitrides is narrower I don't know. I don't know. Oxide electron conductors are a known quantity and a good starting point. Well, the reason I was worried about it was because the ions are sent to the environment. Yeah. Toxic, and nitrogen is the electron yeah. Nitrogen is the electron. Yeah. So one, the, the follow-up study that I've only recently begun is, you know, it's it's the it's the interfacial contact layer between your oxide conductor and your absorber that's at question here. If you grew a sufficiently thick layer, perhaps you wouldn't care what happens at the top. You know, how much is the bottom affected by There's going to be a diffusion length. There's going to be some self-limited diffusion of oxygen. Uh, the hope there is that you could find a material uh, combination where the, um, the buried barrier would be protected from subsequent over or under oxidation or whatever it is that might cause trouble. All right. Yeah. If each of those electrons then goes out into your circuit, no, no, good point. So, so wire, aren't they all at the same voltage? Yeah, yeah. So I skipped over that. The, the when you do this sort of back of the envelope calculation of the theoretical limiting efficiency, you assume one operating voltage. So you actually throw out everything below that operating voltage, and you take everything above that operating voltage at that operating voltage. Yeah. If you go to a finite band. Um, very recent paper on the archive actually shows you don't take that much of a hit down from the 65% if you start to take a narrow uh, few hundred MeV width of, of hot carriers. Um, but essentially, from a from a double E standpoint, this just increases the operating voltage of the cell. There's no yeah, I mean it, it's, it's simple in that sense. You get you get you just raises the operating voltage. That's how it achieves the higher operating efficiency. So how is that different from raising the band gap in terms of well, so raising so the 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 optimal band gap for the solar spectrum is about 1.4 electron volts. That is that's how you get to the 33% Shockley quasar limit. If you raise the band gap above that, you start to lose because you absorb less of the solar spectrum. So that that 33% Shockley quasar limit is band gap optimized. And so when you're reaching when you're reaching equilibrium between the different mm -hmm. electrons, actually some of them are. Yeah, certainly. 
because you have some spectrum and they collide amongst themselves. And you're relying on this well-known fact that you have a separation of time scales for electron thermalization and then for electron lattice thermalization. Yeah. yeah. But you, you have an operating, a well-defined operating voltage. It's, there's nothing fuzzy there. You, you know what you're going to get out of one of these cells in theory. They're probably paying attention, but They're it's not directly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, starting with that idea, Um, on a five to ten year basis, understanding uh, how to control the electronic properties of these oxide electrodes is something that directly translates to present day technologies. That's something we're actually talking to IBM right now about writing a goalie proposal on that because um, they care about that. Uh, the long term goal of sh demonstrating a hot electron current from a device on a bench top is exactly that. It's a long term goal. It's the type of thing that I would hope would catalyze subsequent evolutionary improvements in cost and scale up and efficiency. Um, it, it, that's the type of thing that you would, um, you would hope would be something that industry would pay attention to in decades. But I, you know, I'm, I guess I mean to take a realistic look at the time scale for really fundamental things to make an impact in the way we ex convert and use energy. And the fact is, Fossil fuels are just a tremendous resource. And, and uh, to compete with that, you need to look first at cost savings, and second at, at technological wizardry. And that explains, for example, why a single sort of old, school old school approaches still, to a large extent, rule the roost, because the, the, the cost savings have been achieved there. I mean, you're looking at so many you know, inverter costs, balance of systems, uh, supply chains, and it's just it's way beyond my scope. Thanks.